everybody. Welcome to our webinar on big data and beautiful video, how ClickHouse enables MUX to deliver content at scale. I'm delighted to have our guest, Adam Brown, with us today. We'll be digging into how MUX uh, uh, goes after this, this problem and how ClickHouse enables them to, uh, 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 to manage data for their business. Before we dig too deeply into this, I'd like to just point out a few things that will help you enjoy this webinar. First, uh, the webinar is being recorded, and um, we will send you a link to both the webinar recording as well as the slides shortly after the webinar is finished. So you don't have to frantically take notes. Uh, the, the webinar will be available to you. Second thing, we have a question and answer box, which you can find on the control screen. So if you uh, have questions during the webinar, feel free to pop the questions into that, uh, type them in. If possible, we'll take them during the talk. We also have abundant time at the end for question and answer. Uh, final thing, we do a poll at the end of every webinar. This is to help us, it's three simple questions, helps us determine what the next topics will be, how we're doing on, on this webinar, and what your level of ClickHouse usage is. These help us make the webinars better. So with that, I'd like to dive in and talk a little bit about the folks on the call. So as I said, uh, we are delighted to have Adam Brown, Head of Technology and Architecture at MUX. He's one of the MUX co-founders and he has extensive uh, experience in video encoding, going back to Zencoder, a pioneering uh, uh, cloud uh, video recording service. So uh, for my, as far as my background, I'm CEO of Altinity. I've been working on database systems for over 30 years, in fact, about 37 at this point, uh, with uh, additional work on virtualization and security. So I've worked on a lot of databases. ClickHouse is approximately number 20. A little bit about our businesses. Mux is an API platform that helps people make beautiful video possible for every development team. Adam will be going into detail about this, how the business works and how it's enabled by data. Altenity, my company, is the leading software and services provider for ClickHouse. We're a major committer to the ClickHouse project, and we're also a uh, big community sponsor, both in the US as well as Western Europe. So with those intros, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Adam to dig into MUX, how it works, and how data is important to their business. Thanks, Robert, um, and hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, to start off, I'll give you a quick overview of what MUX is and, and, and how, we're, how we're doing things. So this is an example of, that AWS gives about all of the pieces that you need to put together in order to, to uh, stream video effectively today. Um, so um, you know, if you look at the, the next slide, there's uh, a lot of different components. You've got ingest, storage, transcoding, um, uh, your, your origin, CDN delivery, monitoring. All of these things that really take a lot of expertise and knowledge to put together. Um, the example that we like to use, um, if you look at the next slide, is if in you know years ago before Stripe, you payments was a, a similarly complicated procedure where you had to wire together a lot of different pieces. Um, similarly for text messaging before Twilio, both of those companies replaced kind of these um, these uh, difficult workflows with single um, uh, API calls, uh, very simple to use APIs. Um, so back looking at kind of the complexity of all this put together again, Mux is trying to do the same thing, uh, but for, for video streaming. So our, basically our video product is you post a URL to a video to us or directly upload it to us. We give you back a playback URL that can be used on any device, mobile, desktop, TV, and that has multi-bit rate delivery. So HLS, um, you know, delivery for, for degraded networks. Um, you know, we've, we've optimized the encoding for those videos um, and, as we, and we do all of this with live streaming as well. So we have two products, one's Mux Video, um, the other is Mux Data. Um, Mux Video is the product I really just described that is the kind of end to end, you give us the video, we handle everything in between. Mux Data is our um, product for, for measuring the performance of that. Um, they're each standalone products. The data product is used um, by people that don't use Mux Video. Um, and this is what we'll dig into a little bit more today, but the, the details of Mux data is that we, we collect client-side telemetry um, from lots and lots of different um, platforms. So everything from Roku's to Xbox's, obviously iOS and Android. Um, and we put together dashboards and alerting systems uh, for customers to um, 
you know, see how well it's performing across lots of different dimensions. And obviously, Muck Video uses the same data as well to, to optimize the product. Um, on the data product in particular, we have a few ways to access this data. We have APIs for both getting those metrics out. Um, so the historical metrics, we have real-time metrics, which is kind of current state of the world. Um, we've, we've actually used that for the past two Super Bowls. Uh, Fox and CBS um, have used that to monitor their, their IP streaming. Um, kind of in real time to make uh, decisions on, you know, is this certain network segment out? Should we swap over to another one? Are we performing well all across all of our devices? Um, we also have dashboards for viewing this data in our product as well. And we also do we, all of this data, we, we treat it as, you know, it's your data. You can export it to um, your own platform. We can stream it out in real time. And we also have uh, alerts driven off of it as well. Okay, thanks, Adam. So what, what I'm going to do is, oh, excuse me, you've got more stuff here. Sorry. Uh, well, just, just a, a few more um, you know, use yeah. cases for this data. So most of our data for, our, his, for our, our data product comes from our SDKs. And here's a list of how many we support there. Um, the, we, internally, we also collect all of our CDN log data. So this is access logs for every piece of content that's requested. We put that into ClickHouse as well. And also, we have a ton of internal monitoring use cases in ClickHouse. Um, Real quick examples um, of where we use some of this data. Um, this was a couple of years ago, Verizon had a major network outage in the Northeast. And this graphs here are from some of our ClickHouse data based on the two different CDNs that they were, um, we were delivering the data through. So um, you can see when the network outage happened on, on one network segment, we're able to automatically switch over and deliver that through a different CDN. That's the, the green and, and yellow bars there. Um, and then Finally, uh, we use this data also internally to optimize the video encoding itself. So any particular video um, may be most optimally encoded at a different bit rate. That's kind of what these uh, um, charts on the right are showing. You know, low complexity video, you can deliver the same quality video at a lower bit rate. Um, and once we can select that optimal bit rate, we can also use our global um, network data in order to build the right um, what we call rendition set for delivering that data so that for delivering that video so that's things like you know maybe you know half of your viewers only have um, um, 500 megabit connect or you know, 500 kilobit connections um, we'll we'll build a, a, a encoding of just that 500 kilobit to kind of maximize delivery there so that's just some of the use cases that we have for this amount of data and where we're using clickhouse to query it quickly and, and effectively and then actually drive automated decisions um, in the video product as well. Okay, now it's my turn. Thank you very much, Adam. So what I'd like to do now is just jump in and give a little bit of background on some of the general ClickHouse feature, features that, uh, that Mux is leaning on. And then Adam will come back and go into much more detail about how they use these in, in uh, uh, different ways to, uh, uh, to enable uh, Mux data to function. So let's start with a very basic intro. I know that there's some people on this, uh, are attending this webinar who may not have used uh, ClickHouse before. So let's start with the most basic concept and that's the merge tree table engine. ClickHouse depends on, uses table engines in a way that's a little bit similar to MySQL. If you are a, an old time MySQL user, the idea is that each table engine is optimized to access and to manage and deliver data in a different way. Merge tree is the most important one overall because it is the basic uh, structure that is used to maintain very large tables of data. And that's, uh, that's where ClickHouse, as you'll see in the presentation, uh, when, when Adam comes back, you'll see that's, uh, that's, that's a particular focus for for ClickHouse to deal with very, very large fact tables. So when we define a merge tree table engine, we use SQL, a uh, little bit tuned for the dialect that the ClickHouse uses. And there's some important components here. There's an engine uh, clause, which, and here we select merge tree. We then partition by, that's, uh, and in this case, we're breaking the data. This is uh, uh, sample data on airline on-time performance. So we're going to break the data up by date. <clears throat> Moreover, in the parts, we're actually going to uh, break it down by month. And so this gives ClickHouse guidance how the table should be broken up into segments that can be processed independently. And then finally, within those parts, we're going to give an order, which is going to tell ClickHouse how to build a, a primary key index as well as sort the data in, in the parts. <clears throat> 
So this is the basic structure. There's about a dozen uh, or so, at least a dozen or so uh, variants of this table type. You'll see a couple of them as we, as we go forward. So what I'd like to do now is just dive into the actual layout within the parts of a merge tree table. Because this is very important to understand why it is that ClickHouse is so fast and, uh, and, and also to give you some guidance on um, how you can optimize the performance further. So within, the, within these parts, we see some major data structures. The first thing is we have what's called a primary.idx file. This is the primary key index. And it is a sparse index, which means that it only has entries for every, and by default, every 8,192 rows. What this means is that we can access data in chunks using a relatively small index that will typically fit in memory for, um, for tables that are even very, very large. Then what that index is pointing to is uh, basically dual files, which are arrays that actually point to the data. So ClickHouse is a column store, which means that as opposed to storing all the data of a row together, the, it, we instead store all the data of each column together. You can think of it as a long array broken up into chunks. And the way that we would refer to a point in, in the data is we would find an entry, we would sort of run down, zoom down this primary.idx file if we're, you know, if we have a query that, um, that uses one of the fields in that index, we would locate <coughs> the point in this .mrk2 file, that's basically an array of pointers that shows us where the segment of compressed data for that row begins. And then we would go ahead and read that. So that's a typical way of accessing. We call this, this, um, this segment of data in the index, we call that a granule. We call the, um, the marks in the .mrk2 uh, files, these entries, we call them marks, and then finally compress blocks for the data. So in some cases, ClickHouse will not be able to use this index because you're filtering on different conditions or you're just doing a brute force query. In that case, it's just going to scan the, it's just going to scan the rows. So um, that's the basic layout. One other thing I should point out is that ClickHouse has a special optimization that you will see if it has null values in the, row, in the rows. It's not shown here, but if you have a, a column that is described as is set to be nullable, you will see an extra set of .mrk2 and bin files for each of those columns. And what those store is a bitmap, which basically points to, enables you to identify which row values for that column are null. So it adds extra storage. It's an extra file that you have to look at. Now, one of the really key things that makes this work is compression. So because we have stored the data in an array for each column, that means that the type is similar. We also have a sort order, which often further improves the, the, the odds of compression because the data is non-random. So, um, so by default, ClickHouse will use LZ4 compression, and you can get enormous uh, performance gains from that. So, uh, because it's, it's going to compress the data down and make it quite small. You can also use what are called codecs, and these come in a couple different flavors. There's a very common, a uh, codec is, is a type specific transformation on the data that basically organizes it in a different way before we turn it over for compression. One of the most important transformations that we run is called low cardinality. And what this does is it takes a string and it looks at every value in the part and turns it into a, a value. It basically puts it in a dictionary. And then instead of storing the strings, we just show it. We just store integer offsets into that dictionary. Well, Cardinelli works really well for any column where the values are sort of on the order of 10,000 or less. And um, this is an example of a test table where we're not only using the low cardinality um, transformation or codec, if you will, but we're also then picking between different types of, uh, of compression. So LZ4 as well as ZSDD, which is also supported by ClickHouse. What we then see is that if we, if we load this with test data and I had some fake data, which I generated, but was, you know, had a reasonable distribution to, to give me a way of testing the effectiveness, we can now see the effect of, first of all, compression on the basic, the, the first column set of bars, 
is column A with no low cardinality applied to it. And what we see is we have the uncompressed size, we get down to 20.84% 20, uh, with LZ4, we get to down, down to 12.28% uh, with ZSDD. So pretty good compression just out of the box. What, what we then see is that if we apply low cardinality, at least in the LZ4 case, we get even better compression because what's doing is what this is doing is it's reducing the amount of data that we stored that we had stored before compression. And then ZSDD, as it turns out, is pretty good at compressing Im integers. So that gets us to below 8% in terms of total data volume. So this can have a huge effect on both the amount of storage, plus because ClickHouse performance is fundamentally based on how much I.O. you do, that's really the most important, uh, impor important determinant over all of performance. The more that you can reduce the data that's in storage, the faster you're gonna go because ClickHouse can just uh, read it out of storage as quickly as possible. So one common question is, well, how did I get those numbers? Uh, it turns out that ClickHouse has really awesome cat system catalogs. And what we have here is uh, basically the query that I use to get uh, that I used to get those numbers that were in the previous slide. And it also illustrates a kind of cool uh, ClickHouse feature, which is the bar function, where you can even, you don't have to go to, uh, to Google Docs, you can actually generate those bar graphs right inside the, right inside the SQL query. So this is a great, uh, this is a great feature and um, uh, something that as you're, you know, as you're working with ClickHouse, tuning schema, checking out uh, performance, you want to go back to the system.columns table and look at the level of compression you're getting and keep tuning it until you, until, um, until you can't uh, reduce it anymore. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about another really important ClickHouse feature, which is materialized views. So in addition to compression, which reduces the data, compression and codecs, which reduce the data stored in the, um, in the source table, one of the other really big features that ClickHouse has is materialized views, which restructure the data and put it in a different table. And this is generally used because, uh, or typically used because it will allow you to downsample the data in a way that will give you ready answers to things that you wanted, to questions that you commonly ask. Here's an example. So we have a uh, benchmark that we run that was originally developed by the Timescale DB folks. And um, it uses a CPU table, which contains a bunch of measurements of the activity on particular CPUs. So a common question in monitoring is what is the current CPU usage? And um, so just tell me what, what it is now. I don't care what it was two months ago. I wanna know what it is right this second or, or the, the last update that you have. So you can actually construct a materialized view which will systematic, every time data is inserted in the CPU table, it will store the last value that was, uh, that was recorded in the materialized view. So the materialized view acts as a trigger. This is an example of part of the, de the definition of that view. It's basically a select that fires automatically. It uses some special syntax that, that uh, ClickHouse makes available to uh, control aggregation very precisely. And in this particular case, it's looking for the maximum time in uh, by CPU, and then is basically adding that row into the into the, um, uh, the a new table. This table uses an engine called Summing Merge Tree, which is optimized for doing aggregation. And the key thing here is you get enormous compression of the data far beyond what's uh, what's available through LZ4 or ZSDD because you're only storing a fraction of the data. So these examples here show you the typical. Um, levels of reduction of data size that you would get. This is a feature that allows you to get, uh, you know, to get queries to come back in milliseconds. The most common way that this is used is to do aggregations. That's a very common use case throughout virtually all, uh, used by a very large uh, percentage of the people who have ClickHouse installations. So for example, a, a common pattern, if you're recording web visits, is to go ahead and have your source data, which you might hold for something like seven days. And ClickHouse has a great feature called TTL, uh, which allows you to say, hey, hold it for seven days and then automatically delete it. 
and then you have long-term aggregates. So for example, you might want to remember unique visitors, you might want to enter the number of uh, hourly sessions. These are things that you can do in the, in, the, um, in the materialized view. There are many other uses of materialized views and actually Adam has a really cool uh, alternative usage that, uh, that he'll visit in the later in the slides. There's another way, yet another way of cutting down IO, which I want to mention here because it, it turns out to be relevant in some of the stuff that, that Mux is doing and also in, in general for, uh, for large ClickHouse installations. And that's what it calls skip indexes. So with ClickHouse, as I've mentioned, uh, performance is all about reducing IO. There are other things obviously, but reducing IO is the best thing you can do. So a skip index is basically an index that enables you to look at different marks when you're scanning columns and say, the data I'm looking for is not there. And so you can skip reading it. You can, you can skip reading it, you can skip decompression. All that time is, is, is then freed up so that you can have faster response. And there's a number of different index types. This uh, shows you typical add, uh, add index commands. So for example, an ngram index, which is kind of like a bloom filter on, um, on chunks of text. There's a set index which stores uh, unique values. That turns out to be kind of handy for indexing things like UUIDs. Uh, it's fairly flexible across data types. So you can put the, you can add these in easily. If you run an optimized table, it will actually implement the index. You can also do an altered table in current releases, which will, um, which will cause the index to be materialized. The effectiveness really depends on how your data is distributed. So the more typically widely distributed high cardinality data tends to have pretty good effects with these indexes. And this is an example from our pet flight data set where we're basically filtering data based on, um, first of all, destination. That was one test where we choose a couple different airports and by carrier, uh, where we're again, um, looking at a couple different carrier values. And so in this data set, for example, if we, if we use column carrier and we select um, a carrier named ML, and I don't even know what airline that is because it's a fairly um, a small one. What we see is that it, reduce, it gets a pretty good um, uh, query response rate comes back in 90 milliseconds in this test. By contrast, if we set the carrier to be WN, which is Southwest, that's about one seventh of the rows in this data set. So as a result, the rows tend to be sprinkled through most of the marks and you end up reading most of the data anyway. So you get much slower query performance and the index is less effective. But for high cardinality data that's, that's evenly distributed, this can be, um, or that's, that has um, favorable distribution, shall we say, this can be a very, uh, a, a very good technique for reducing IO and speeding up query response. And then one final thing I'd like to talk about is ClickHouse just has a wealth of table engines. You've already seen two of them so far. Um, but one I'd like to mention because uh, Bucks makes use of it is a collapsing merge tree. And this belongs to a family of, there's at least three table engines that are designed to help you deal with updating data. Um, ClickHouse in general does not do updates or deletes. What we like to do is we like to write more data which cancels out what happened before. The reason we do this is actually going in and rewriting a row or rewrite as it happens, rewriting a bunch of columns is a very expensive operation. It's much simpler to go somewhere else, put a mark in and say, hey, cancel what I said and then let queries sort it out and eventually you get it, um, get it merged into the table. So the collapsing merge tree has a, is, is kind of interesting. It's a variant on this. The way that it works is it has a sign column. And so if in this example here, what we show is we have a collapsing merge tree, which is just holding some test data, user ID and views. And what we're gonna do is we're going to, in the first insert, we say, hey, user 32 currently has 55 views. A little later on, we get more metric data and it turns out user 32 now has 98 views. So what we do is we add a row with the first this row with minus one and what that does is it cancels out the, um, the previous row and then um, we have a row which has a one on it which has the new value and then click house if you uh, do a select off it for example in, in this very simple example I can just put a final um, a keyword on the end of the select it will automatically collapse the rows down and give me the final value. 
It turns out when you're actually using them in a distributed system, it's more complicated than that. But this table does give you a way of dealing with updates in a systematic fashion that doesn't impact your performance. So, um, <clears throat> okay, we've got a, uh, We've got a couple questions here. What we'll do is we'll go ahead and take those in the um, in the question and answer. What I'd like to do right now is go ahead and turn this over to uh, Adam again and uh, talk about specifically what you're doing with ClickHouse underneath Mux. Sure thing. Yeah, and, and I think so. We'll, we'll start by talking about our data product and particularly our historical metrics product. Um, one of the reasons I want to start there is we this was the the first product that we built in Mux. Um, we did not build it on ClickHouse. Um, and as we as we um, as we went along, um, we found it harder and harder to manage our existing solution, and we made a huge migration over the last year to ClickHouse with with a lot of success. So that's really this um, down the middle here. We've got um, the the beacons coming in from from the left, and the, those beacons are sent from our SDKs on the player side. So it, the way that works is basically once every ten seconds or so, uh, a beacon is sent from a, a playing video player saying, you know, this person has had this much rebuffering or they've watched this many more seconds of video and all the kind of details about the, um, you know, the client itself. And um, we're going to talk about the metrics route in particular. So this is our historical metrics pages for video views. Um, this is, uh, this data comes from um, the, those beacons, but we have a layer that turns them in, that assembles them into the full video view session. So, so the way we look at this um, is the total viewer experience score by total viewing session. Um, we have some other products, particularly real-time product, that treat things more as like what's happening right now in real time across network segments. But this one's a bit unique in that it, it has to assemble all of those beacons into the full view. So on the left here, you can see the, the kind of charts that you can build. So we can say, show me how iOS and Android are comparing, um, you know, over the last day or, or up, to, up to like three months is our typical retention period. And on the right, you can see this is the data that is actually built off of. So this is a, a full video view. You can see the full window of everything that's happened, you know, all the playing, paused um, events and all the, the details. So in ClickHouse, our rows are that full video view and they're about, I think, um, about 150 columns wide for all the, the, um, the details about the video view. Um, on the next page, we have a few of our kind of uh, metrics around what we're storing there. So. Currently, we're storing billions of views a month in ClickHouse. Um, at, on the large side, you know, 500 million views per customer, um, generally averaging around 100,000 beacons per second of, of raw data. And we're operating all of this off of raw, um, raw data today. So those, all of our queries operate off of those full video view records, no, no pre-aggregation. Um, next slide. So the way this works, we have multiple tiers of collectors collecting those beacons, putting them on Kafka, directing them to our processing layer. And this processing layer is all a, a kind of a custom in-house um, um, solution that can assemble those beacons and write them out as these full video view records. It can also export those out to other Kafka streams and go to customers and partners and drive real-time alerting um, functionality. But today we're mostly gonna talk about this historical metrics operating on the video views themselves to the next slide. So where, where we started with this, we, we started like, like any reasonable startup would do with, with, with Postgres. Um, and then we needed a bigger Postgres. Uh, and then we needed a, a sharded Postgres. So we moved to Citus. And, uh, and then we moved to a, a, an even fancier Citus uh, setup where um, not only were we using Citus distributed Postgres tables, we were also bringing in uh, columnar storage into Postgres, managing a lot of complexity there. Ultimately, we got really fancy with it. We had Airflow um, driving lots of aggregation. So we're pre-aggregating all of these metrics into um, hourly, hourly um, divisions by you know, a limited set of, um, of um, dimensions. So this started getting really, really expensive, really, really hard to maintain. Um, it worked, but you know, it was a, a constant struggle to keep it running and keep aggregation happening um, um, effectively. So, Really what, what the switch over to ClickHouse from there allowed us was an unlimited filter depth, which we didn't have before. Before we had pre-aggregated data down to about three levels of, of filtering um, because of the aggregation was so expensive. We got to eliminate that um, completely. Now we could have things like exclusion filters. So we say, you know, show me everything that's not Android, for example. Um, being able to, to run queries on dynamic 
time ranges. So instead of just that hourly aggregation, we can do minutely or 10 minute aggregation and ultimately scale. Um, our existing system, the more, the more traffic that we added, we were finding kind of an, an exponential increase in the amount of uh, compute costs for doing aggregation, as you can imagine. Um, so moving this all to raw video views, um, we, we actually saw a uh, dramatic uh, decrease in, or well, increase in performance, decrease in lat latency for these queries um, on our ClickHouse system versus even our pre-aggregated um, CIDIS data. Um, so you can see almost everything improved at, at least 2x, um, um, but, uh, but even our, like our video view uh, listing themselves improved, which we'll, we'll talk about a little more in a second. Um, on the kind of cost benefit side, um, since we're no longer doing any aggregation, we're saving a ton on um, CPU and disk there. Um, the columnar compression, particularly low cardinality, we saw about a, a third of the disk size that we saw before on the on the unaggregated data even. So we had this huge block of, of our pre-aggregated data. We still had the, um, you know, the raw unaggregated data um, and we're still seeing just on that unaggregated data, a third of the disk size used uh, from our previous solutions. We're, we're running smaller machines and in the process of this migration that we made over the first half of this year, um, we, we halved our, our infrastructure costs on the project while the volume doubled. Um, so it was just a huge win all the way around. Um, we did run into some challenges. It wasn't wasn't all um, you know, it wasn't it wasn't the easiest migration in the world. You know, ClickHouse and Postgres are, are not the same. You have to think about things a little bit differently. The queries need to be rewritten, not a drop-in replacement. Um, we we have uh, we do update views, which uh, Robert alluded to earlier, with where we use the collapsing merge stream. We'll go into uh, a little bit more in depth in a second. And as well, we individual record lookups were. Um, presented a, an interesting challenge. So I think on the next slide, we're talking about the, the view updates. Um, so, so why do we have updates? Um, the concept of putting together a video view session is not um, always the easiest thing to, to get your head around conceptually. What happens, for example, um, so, so we can't really write the view into this queryable database until the view is complete. Um, so we, we have a part of that processing layer says, this view has now ended, it goes into this, um, this database to, to be queried. Um, so we have a relatively low percentage of these that get updated, but some examples of that is say, say someone pauses the video for, uh, or closes their laptop lid for 20 minutes and comes back and opens it back up and it starts playing. We wanna reassemble those together. There's a couple of ways to handle this. The way that we had historically handled it was we have that, that processing layer, the ability to um, remember what we had set, set before, reassemble those together into a new record and write those out. Um, so uh, what we ended up doing, since we kind of already had this stored data of what we, we knew we had written before, we were able to use the um, collapsing merge tree issue, th that uh, negative sign um, value for the, the old row, canceling it out and issuing the new one. Um, uh, this probably wouldn't work as well if we had, you know, if it was 80% plus of the views getting updated. Realistically, we see about 10, 15% of the views updated and this you know, solution works works pretty well. We do use the final keyword sometimes. Um, and that was one of the things that um, was probably the most challenging about this approach. Um, the final keyword does have a performance hit because um, it needs to kind of reconcile all of those plus and minus signs. Um, so we use it in, in some cases like listing video views, right? So so if you want to get like the, the the full list of the, the records, you need to squash those down as not to pre present duplicates. Um, and for that use case, it works, um, the performance is fine. They're on the larger metrics queries though, if you're looking back at say 90 days of data at once, um, we've taken some different approaches where we can actually use the sign value in the query to cancel it out. So in this metrics work around um, little um, point here for, for calculating an average instead of you know using the final keyword and the average clause, we can actually um, take advantage of the, the sign itself to, uh, to kind of know how to cancel out those values on the queries. Um, we also run a nightly optimize, which basically um, does this collapsing and, and rewrites the partition, I, I, or rewrites the part. I think I'm saying that right, Robert. <laughs> you can correct me on the details there if, if I'm wrong, but uh, this basically does that full collapse so that it doesn't have to be um, presented or doesn't have to be redone later. Um, 
Oh, and the, the next challenge was the individual view lookup. So we, we allow customers to look up individual views by like their ID or a customer provided ID. There's a few different um, other ways that, that people can look up. It use like a, a, a particular value to look up an individual view. Um, so we use a materialized view approach where basically we have a separate, a second table that is created um, that more or less maps exactly which part that uh, video view record could be and by those IDs. Um, and then when we're doing those uh, lookups, we can check that table first to know kind of exactly what part um, to look into. Um, this is, you know, uh, Robert mentioned earlier, their skip index approach that wasn't available uh, yet, I believe in the, the kind of the main branch when we were doing this build out. So this, we, we still need to explore that. Um, but this actually works surprisingly well. Um, and we use it for, for several different use cases similar to this for different kind of um, fake indexes as you all. You can dig into a lot more of the technical details here in our, our blog post that I put a link to below as well. Um, finally, uh, we have, and we make extensive use of the nullable um, um, columns that Robert mentioned earlier. There's a, a note here in the, in the ClickHouse documentation, it, it mentions that, you know, nullable can negatively impact performance. Um, I was joking with Robert earlier, they like, any time that you put that in there, like that's, you know, any engineer is going to recoil for that. And, and we did it internally as well. Some one of our engineers would go to, to do this implementation. Um, we had made, we had used uh, nullable extensively in our old implementation. All of our queries were, were written expecting, um, you know, these potentially nullable values. And where this comes into play, say, say for example, uh, we, we really want to know the difference between, uh, you know, no one centimetric uh, for a, a certain, for a certain uh, measurement versus like the, um, the measurement was actually zero, right? So it's very important for us for a lot of our measurements to know um, that, it, that it was null and not, not zero. So instead of doing all the work at this migration step to um, re-implement things to not use noble, we just said, well, let's try it. And turns out it does have a performance impact up to like 10, 15% in our experience, but um, that was totally fine for our use case. And as you saw earlier from our performance graphs, uh, much better than what we were doing um, before. So some deployment details about how we're running this. All of our clusters run in Kubernetes. Um, we've done that from the beginning. We've run everything in Kubernetes. Um, I wouldn't say there's been any um, you know, significant uh, uh, challenges to running it in Kubernetes, no more than there are running any other database in, in Kubernetes. Uh, in fact, it's probably a little bit simpler. Um, so we have four clusters and four deployments today, all done a little bit differently. The one we were just discussing is the historical metrics. And for that, we, we, we run uh, one cluster with, um, as like the primary cluster, it has replication internally. Um, we also run a second cluster um, that is, is, um, is replicated as well. So technically we have four replicas of this data. Um, and, it, and we weren't going to do that originally when we were looking at kind of specking out for costs. Um, but it turns out once we saw how good the compression was, um, we have this opportunity to store all this data with this many replications and it's still significantly cheaper than what we were doing before. Um, and part of the reason we run the secondary cluster, one for, for fellow performance, but also for doing um, migrations, we have this opportunity to operate on the a more or less live cluster with a, a scary migration uh, and before we go to the, the primary cluster. And so we treat this kind of as a blue green deployment where we, we can run a major migration on the primary or on the secondary, swap over to swap the, the queries over to it, and then run on the other cluster. And that's been really, really nice. Um, similar story with our real time metrics. We don't use the internal replication. Real time is very short lived data. We only um, you know have like a, a day's worth of retention on it. Um, but we we do the the blue green kind of uh, multi cluster approach there as well. Um, for our CDN logs, we don't do replication, and we actually usually run it where we were running it all on a single node. Um, it's it's not a it's not a customer facing you know with uh, cluster with uptime requirements. It's just for internal um, metrics queries, and so I have to make a point here that you can get surprisingly far on a single um, node um, and just growing it kind of vertically um, before you even have to think about going going horizontal with it. Um, the last cluster we have is our raw beacons. So we were actually recently started recording all of those raw beacons before they get rolled up into video views, um, mostly for debugging purposes. Um, 
um, but we're actually looking at turning that into um, some product facing um, as well. It's very, very helpful for debugging. Um, all of this is fronted by CH Proxy. Um, it's a great little project. Um, if you if you haven't looked at it before, it handles some some extra layer of caching, um, user routing, and and rate limiting, and we use that to swap you know queries between these different clusters. So we can say you know um, our our API dashboard user is now going to be routed to the secondary cluster or the primary or the or the backup cluster. Um, additionally, it exposes Prometheus metrics, um, which we is what we use for all of our metrics. So um, I know the 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 um, Clickhouse operator does that now as well, but um, but back when we first started using this, uh, this was the best way to get uh, Prometheus metrics out of ClickHouse. So what's next for us, we're building some more advanced alerting um, based off of uh, kind of continuous queries to ClickHouse. Um, we're also moving most of our internal like BI metrics and data warehousing into at least partially into ClickHouse. Anything that's at a significant scale, we, we default to that. Um, and I mentioned a moment ago, those um, beacons, um, that beacon database, we're, we're looking at kind of turning that um, processing layer that we, we have today that is this custom Golang um, servers and, and rather complicated into can we just kind of run materialized views off of the raw beacons in ClickHouse um, to, to, um, to uh, materialize those, those video view records. Yeah, and some some final takeaways. Um, uh, several of our our data engineers and, and data um, architects, when they ran into um, you know experimenting with ClickHouse, have made this statement, and, and I've made it plenty of times myself. Is it feels like magic operating off of the the raw data like this, um, particularly given where we came from, um, operating these very complicated, very large, very expensive um, aggregation clusters. Um, it's just made a world of difference in our um, simplicity of. Um, around scaling and, and operations. Um, and it's, ClickHouse has really become our default for statistical data. Um, anything that's at a, you know, a significant um, insert rate that we're gonna ever potentially run a, an ad hoc query on, it's going into ClickHouse these days. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, pull our pictures over here so that y'all can see what we look like. Um, now that we're not, uh, not destroying the slide. So thank you so much, Adam. That that was a really, really great presentation. Um, I have a couple questions, follow-up questions, but we also have some from the crowd. Uh, just before we get into those, I'd like to go ahead and launch our poll. So uh, for the uh, webinar attendees, I'm going to go ahead and launch that right now. Please uh, go ahead and fill that out. It will take you 15 seconds tops. Uh, we're not asking anything complicated. Um, I'm going to go through some of the open questions. Uh, there was a question, is there a primary key or an index? Um, you said index and sort, uh, would you please explain it? Uh, great question, uh, I, I think I glossed over that. So ClickHouse doesn't have a primary key in the sense of, of a constraint, uh, the way we're used to in databases like MySQL or Postgres. Uh, the primary key is really a primary key index. You can have, um, you can have additional values of the you know sort of multiple values with the same primary key in merge tree merge tree is perfectly happy with that it doesn't really care so but there's a distinction between the the entries in the primary key that sparse index i talked to you and your sort order that sort order can be different um, and it can also have more columns than the primary key so people can play around with that to uh you know to get the to get the best performance one of the things you typically do with uh, sorts i should as i said before is by sorting the right way, you can get better compression. Um, there was, so uh, <clears throat> there was a question, materialized view can be joined with a merge tree table. And uh, Adam, I think your example showed that pretty well with the, with the lookup tables that you guys were using. Yep. So, and did you guys have any difficulties with that? You know, like getting that view to work? Uh, Cause again, it's, you have to construct it, you have to put it in your queries, but it looked fairly straightforward. Yeah, um, I didn't do the implementation, so it was easy for me, <laughs> but I, I didn't hear any complaints. So, okay. so yeah, I, I think it was pretty straightforward. Yeah, okay, great. Um, another question, uh, does the final keyword affect the query performance? Yes, it does. Uh, it's expensive. I don't know if you guys have, uh, do you have any comments on that? Because I know you were, you're sometimes using it, sometimes not. What was the trade-off, uh, if you want to discuss yeah, the trade-off a little bit? Sure. Um, it, it really depends on the query, particularly how many parts you're going to be querying over. I, we 
we just did a performance comparison this week of one of the routes. Um, we what we saw like a ten like a 10, 15 percent um, increase in in latency on those queries, but it was still well within the bounds that we we wanted. It it's really something you have to measure because it's it's so case by case. Right. And final the the final keyword is is uh, now parallelized in in the latest uh, ClickHouse releases. So that's we are doing some work to improve the performance on that, uh, and hopefully it'll be easier to use. Um, we had a question here. Migration from Citus, is that why a secondary cluster is required? Um, I'm not sure I totally understand the question. Does that one make sense to you, Adam? Maybe. I'll, I'll treat it like this. We, so the secondary cluster is another ClickHouse cluster. So we, we run two totally independent ClickHouse clusters. And, and one of those reasons, like I mentioned, is to be able to test migrations and things on the, the real production data. Um, we, we did, while we were doing the, the migration from Citus, we ran them both in parallel for about three months. Um, so we ran Citus and both of our new clusters and we would basically A-B tested it. We routed some queries to ClickHouse and, and slowly rolled out more and more and, and, and um, you know, compared it very carefully. Um, we were seeing such good performance with ClickHouse. We, we, you know, switched it all over a little sooner than we expected, but no, it wasn't, it wasn't hard because of that. Technically, we don't need the secondary cluster for you know, um, data kind of integrity reasons, I guess, since we have the replication in the single cluster. Um, but it's it's more of a nice to have from an operational standpoint, and and you know, being able to experiment on the the database and that extra assurance that you know this this query or uh, well, I guess I should also mention we use it for ad hoc internal ad hoc queries that we don't want to run on the production database. Um, it's like a, a perfect mirror that we can you know be more or less a playground. Great, I had a and. Folks, uh, just keep the, if you have more questions, keep uh, sending them in. I had a couple more uh, questions from my side. Uh, going back to your, I'm going to flip back to this, but going back to your um, overview on the deployment details, Kubernetes. So uh, what Kubernetes distribution are you using? Um, give me what version or how are you deploying it? Are you using, for example, are you using EKS or are you using your own, uh, you know, something that you guys are managing yourselves? Or? Yeah, we're, we're using COPS today. Um, ah, okay. Yeah, um, so so we don't we, we run on both Amazon and Google. We looked at using kind of each of their hosted providers, but they they each had their own unique kind of um, you know intricacies. We wanted to be consistent across both, so so we deploy it all with COPS. Um, we're actually looking at migrating to something else, but I don't remember what that is right now. Um, but COPS today. Were there and and what was the you know were there any learning curve issues on Kubernetes, or are you using it more generally so that it was uh, something that you you already had expertise? Yeah, we've been using Kubernetes for a while. Um, it wasn't really anything new here. I, I think one, one thing that we ran into there, since we use Kafka a lot, um, you know, we, we tried initially to use one kind of Zookeeper deployment for everything, um, and that didn't go very well. Um, uh, I think but Kafka can be quite, um, quite intensive on um, Zookeeper, particularly when you're running lots of partitions, as, as well as when you're running replication with, with um, ClickHouse, it can be quite um, um, you know, impactful on Zookeeper performance. So generally now we run a, a Zookeeper kind of per cluster and per application. Okay, great. Yeah, that's, that's actually a recommendation we make not to mix those. It's a bit like oil and water. So um, <clears throat> a second question is on, off this page is, uh, the routing that you do with ch proxy you mentioned uh, sort of user routing to different uh, locations can you talk a little bit about how that's actually implemented and what your um, uh, you know sort of people can understand the plumbing yeah yeah there's there's two different ways to go about it really what what we've done is we've set up in ch proxy kind of a, a user a lot of different users that are routed differently so we we can so let's say for our real-time cluster we have a user that's like the um, the clickhouse real-time green user um, so we have one mechanism of, of at the, the user level, so the API level, picking which user you want to have, and that'll route uh, independently. Um, we can also internally to CH proxy um, um, change the mapping of what, what user goes to what cluster. So CH proxy has a concept of clusters, users, um, and, uh, and, and, and you can map them internally however you want. Uh, it does get a little complica complicated because we, we deploy all that with a, a config map, I believe, still in, in Kubernetes, and you have to roll the proxy nodes um, to, to do that. So it's not the cleanest upgrade. Generally, what we we tended to do is just have a, a ton of very verbose mappings. We even have a mapping like users 
in CH proxy down to each individual node. So if we want to in, in, um, to um, access an individual node externally uh, you know, or from somewhere else in the cluster, we can do that. Um, and that this is also a lot of so like our we have one kind of entry point if we need to access cross clusters we have like MTLS to CH proxy um, and not have to go directly to nodes. Got it. Okay. And and this is the CH proxy is then this routing is invisible to your applications. Is that yes? Yep. They they just they have a notion of user, but beyond that, that's all they need to know. Yeah, the other, we, we do, we have at times done writes, not through CH proxy. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Um, um, in certain use cases, we want to write to specific nodes, right? And not write through the distributed tree, or the, to the distributed um, table. Um, and we'll go directly to the nodes for those. But often we do all of our writes through CH proxy as well, mainly because of the, the, um, the uh, really nice um, metrics that it gives us. Okay. Um, a follow-up question. So you have two clusters. Um, do you take regular backups? Is that how you're handling that? Yeah, we do. We, you know, we've used the, um, this is something that's been in, in flux for a little bit. I, we do take snapshots um, for, for what it's worth. Um, you know, snapshots can be problematic, um, like the actual like EPS volume snapshots, because, you know, the, you don't really know the state of the cluster when you do that. Um, we do that and we have rebuilt from that by, you know, we have relatively large uh, retention in Kafka. So we can um, say, you know, drop every, you know, if something's corrupt on like the leading edge, drop off a couple of days and replay it from Kafka. Um, we do, we have also used the, um, there's a more standard S3 backup approach that we use as well, but we're not using that right now. Um, mm. So- You mean so uh, the ClickHouse backup by any chance? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. We, we, we have used that and I believe we use it for like some of the, like the logs clusters, but really we've more relied on replication and dual writing to clusters and also where we need it longer retention in Kafka to replay in like a disaster recovery scenario. Mm -hmm. And what's your retention in Kafka? How many days do you have in the, in the logs? It varies a lot. Um, so for, it's usually three to seven days for, but for example, our CDN logs are, um, much, much longer. I think we, we still have like 90 days of retention on that. Got it. And what's your, um, another question, what's your rough data size uh, across these clusters? That is a great question. Um, the CDN logs is, is definitely in the, uh, the I'd say they're probably historical metric CDN logs, raw beacons in the tens to, to 30 maybe terabyte range. Real-time metrics is much, much smaller because it's only like a day's worth of retention from the real-time data. Mm -hmm. It's probably a few terabytes at most. Okay. And I had a final question from my side. Do you have any advice for people who are starting out on, on ClickHouse and you know, building, you know, based on your experience of, of building up a fairly sophisticated processing pipeline? Yeah. Um, I would probably, if you're doing it in Kubernetes, start with the operator today. Like we, we don't use the operator. Um, we, we mainly for, because we've built a lot of operator like infrastructure and tooling internally for running databases on, on Kubernetes, but um, we, we've had good success with the operator when we've done it. The other thing would be don't, don't be stingy with memory. That's the thing that we're, we've tried to run really tight um, at times in the past, um, particularly on our real time cluster where we really don't need a lot of CPU and memory um, in theory, um, but ClickHouse really likes to, to have a lot of memory to work with. So go ahead and give it that 16 or 32 gigabytes. Um, I think we've run basically run everything with 32 gigabytes of memory today. Great. Um, yeah. Well, I think we've, we've taken a bunch of questions here, um, both from the crowd as well as I think we covered everything that was uh, listed here. Thank you everybody for the polls. And Adam, thank you so much for coming and uh, coming on today and doing this presentation. It's great having you uh, do this. We also really appreciate all the support that you guys have done to the ClickHouse, for the ClickHouse community and uh, look forward to hearing more presentations from you. Of course, thanks so much for having me. All right. Thanks, everybody. I think we'll call it a day and uh, close the webinar. You'll get a link shortly, uh, both to the slides as well as the recording. So if you have further questions, feel free to ping us at Altenity. We'd be glad to follow up. Thank you and have a great day. Good work, guys.